are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. Oh, what's that? Is that a banjo I hear? No, it's not! Because Rootbound is sponsored by Bluegrass, the plant, not the folk music. Listener, thank you for listening to this episode of Rootbound. I am your host, and my name is Steve. And Rootbound is the podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. And each week, I invite a guest who joins me on the show to share with us all about a plant that means something to them. And then I share with the guest about a plant that means something to me. And through this process, we can all learn more about plants and learn more about each other. It is the philosophy of Rootbound that everybody as a plant that means something to them because plants are so fundamental to our lives as humans on this planet. Now, botany is kind of a weird word, right? I, uh, I can't believe I haven't talked about this before or thought about this before, but I was thinking about the word botany and I was like, why is it botany? Why isn't it like uh, botanology or maybe even like plantology? I think the Latin word for, for plant is planta. Why why botany? It's kind of a weird word. Why doesn't it have that ology, like zoology, which is the study of animals? Um, so I did some research, and this is what I found. I think it's not altogether clear, but but I have kind of coalesced on the main theory. So first of all, the, the etymology of botany is pretty clear. It comes from a ancient Greek word, which is botane. I think that's pronounced correctly, botane. So you can see they're pronounced pretty similar, uh, bo- botany, botane. So that's where it comes from. And uh, botane uh, means pasture or herb or fodder or grass. I, there's a lot of definitions, but it, it means plant-related stuff. And so you see how that's connected. Um, but how did it become the science? And, I th- and, and why didn't it become botanology um, or something like that? And I think it, it has to do with, and this is speculation, but uh, I think it's because botany is one of the very oldest sciences. It was kind of a science before science was even defined as a thing. And if you think about a lot of the ologies that exist, like ornithology or entomology, these are all kind of relatively newer things and pretty specific and kind of when we started formalizing our language about the study of things. Um, But botany is really, really old. You know, people have been exploring plants and studying plants for a very, very, very long time. And you'll see that 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 lack of the ology also has some things in common with other older studies of science like astronomy or chemistry or physics or uh, or medicine, right? All those words have older roots than the more formalized ology-based system of describing the studies of things. So that's why I think it, we, we have botany and not something like uh, plantology. However, apparently there is a, uh, a word that is an ology that is equivalent. I don't think many people use it, but but it is on Wikipedia. And I guess the um, the Greek word for plants in general, not just this like pasture, fodder, grass thing, which is botane, but there is a word for, for plants. You've probably heard this root before, but it's phyto. So I guess phytology is a synonym for botany. But I like botany better. Botany is cool. And uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's where botany comes from. Uh, let's meet our guest. Growing together, it's just botany. Growing together, plenty and me. Hey, Chris, thank you for joining me on this episode of Rootbound. Uh, thank you, Steve. I'm super excited, a little nervous, but super excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, do you have a plan to share with us today? I do. Uh, it did take me a moment to come up with one. I, I think there were several iterations of this conversation, but I finally settled on pitcher plants, uh, specifically the purple pitcher plant, which is a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> but um, a lot of peas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, I can certainly tell you a little bit more about why I chose it, but um, I'm excited to dust off a little memory of, of uh, some research I did on these guys and tell you a little bit more about them. Awesome. That, that's super cool. I, you know, I think pitcher plants when you're like in kindergarten 
it's like Venus flytrap is number one that you think yeah. is the coolest, weirdest plant, and then the pitcher plant is like number two. And then you don't hear about any other carnivorous plants, I think, until you're like much, much older, I think. So like I'm, I know about pitcher plants since probably kindergarten, but I don't really know very much about them at all. Yeah, and I, I will say that I, I was way into Venus flytraps to the point that I unfortunately killed more than a few because I was overzealous uh. in feeding them. Um, <laughs> but for me, I, I was aware of pitcher plants for a while, but it wasn't until... Uh, undergrad that I had an opportunity to um, uh, get to know them even better. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, let's get into that. Why Why did you choose them? Why is the purple pitcher plant meaningful to you? <laughs> yeah. So um, it, like I said, it took me a while to, to kind of settle on a, on a plant. And this should have been, um, maybe, maybe it's just because of the amount of time since I <laughs> did this. Um, so it, during undergrad, uh, I went to the University of Minnesota and I actually... Um, seems like a really, well, it, it was a long time ago, um, had this very strong interest in plants that I deviated um, later in my undergraduate career towards birds. Um, but uh, I took a ecology and a plant biology class during this a summer session while I was an undergrad at the University of Minnesota. And they have um, a research facility at Lake Itasca. And so we lived mm. at the facility over the summer taking uh, two of our core curriculum, ecology and plant biology at the same time. And both of them had a, um, a research requirement. Um, and this um, allowed me to do something that tied in the two classes. I had a separate project actually for my plant biology class, but this was my ecology class. But uh, um, uh, we were at Lake Itasca. They have a very extensive um, uh, bog ecosystem there. And um, we, we chose to do something with the bog ecosystem and then specifically chose pitcher plants as something that um, my classmate and, my, and, and I wanted to study. And what we were particularly interested in knowing because there wasn't, there's, there's more research I would hope at this point, but at the time there had been research uh, to determine whether or not there is actually a process which the plants are generating enzymes and it's, it's more active carnivory versus passive carnivory. That was, dis mm. that was established, but we were trying to determine if there was maybe some mechanism with a uh, mechanical mechanism that um, uh, uh, assisted with, or um, perhaps augmented their ability to produce the enzymes that they needed to uh, digest insects or other, other animals that they, they caught. So that, that was our project. We we're essentially looking at there's little hairs, on the inside mm -hmm. of the pitcher that makes it difficult for insects to escape. And in Venus flytraps, which you may be familiar, the hairs yeah. in the hair are actually what trigger the, um, the trap mechanism to close. So we were seeing if perhaps um, a mechanical, some sort of struggle um, was, uh, was somehow activating the plant to be, to produce more enzymes or to be more, digestive, I guess. Um, interesting. And, interesting. Yeah. So again, it, this was undergrad. We were, <laughs> we were excited to have a project. It's ambitious that, for an undergrad project, actually. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. We, we had like a very small sample size and, and there were probably all sorts of flaws with our um, actual project design. But essentially what we did is we went into the bog, found uh, a number uh, within a, a close proximity, a number of pitcher plants. We emptied them of their liquid, and any uh, prey that may have been present, and then did a series of experiments where we put distilled water back inside um, some of them, put some of the original solution back in others, put prey in some, not prey in others, stimulated hairs in some, but didn't stimulate hairs in others. We had this mm. whole little thing that we did, um, and uh, we determined that the hairs don't do anything to generate more enzyme okay. production or do anything. So it's, they're purely mechanical to keep insects from calling out. Do you, do you know, is, is, has that research held over the, I don't know if you've researched anything lately as uh, has anyone <laughs> else ever like thought about that and, uh, and looked it up because it, it is very logical, right? They, they, they have the same kind of like structures as the Venus flytrap and the Venus flytrap. It is very mechanical. So. Yeah. So there's been a lot of other research on the enzymatic activity. Some plants actually produce, chemicals that uh, in certain concentrations can actually like um, knock out 
insects. And so there's there are studies that have been done to determine if the concentrations are, if that's, that's one additional tool in their toolbox to kind of deal with capturing prey. Um, it, there's been studies on wh- who's attracted and whether or not it's by the nectar or by other, um, other means. But um, it doesn't appear that um, anybody's hmm. gone down that mechanism. They it probably did, other people knew at the time it wasn't, but we thought it was something <laughs> that we would research. We didn't find any data at the time saying one one way or the other. But um, yeah, it was a small experiment that kind of probably ended there in 1991. <laughs> but what what a great example of science, by the way, of having an hypothesis and testing it and then finding out. Well, nope, that's <laughs> that. Yep. But that's science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it was a. It, I mean, we were out there. I mean, it, it got us out into the field. Um, I can't remember if we were out there daily, but every every you know a few days over the course of the class doing this, and it, there was more that we were being exposed to than just the actual um, you know uh, subject being the pitcher plants and this experiment. And it was it was one of my fondest memories of undergrad is that summer session taking ecology and plant biology. It was super intense. Um, two of the biggest classes that we all wanted to do well on um, as biology majors. Um, but, you know, we had access to like all the equipment that you would have in a lab. We used the spectrophotometer. We were out there with our pipettes measuring things. We felt super scientific. So <laughs> That's cool. I was just thinking about how you have to how you have to empty a pitcher plant of its like liquid and you probably have to like suck it out with a pipette or something, right? Cause you can't like turn it over. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what we did. Um, it, it yeah, was, interesting. Um, it was, uh, I mean, there, there may have been a, a different way of going about it. Um, but that's how we chose was to yeah, pipette that makes sense. the contents out. <laughs> Well, that that's super cool. I'm I'm excited to learn more about this. Why don't Why don't we kind of rewind a little bit and just talk about what the plant is? And in, in case people did not learn about them in in kindergarten, like what is a pitcher plant? We talked about enzymes, but maybe you can just talk about what they are and how yeah. they do their thing. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies. Uh, kind of jumped into the um, no. I of course to, to the whole carnivory part, which is the cool part. But um, yeah, so pitcher plants. Uh, there's there's a, a a couple genera if I'm not mistaken they they are old world and new world they I I believe from um, I will say that some of their um, some of the evolution and and relationships between the groups it's a, it's a well across the whole group of carnivorous plants there's the belief that carnivory has evolved at least twelve different times within oh, wow. plants and so the pictures seem to be um, a little bit more that the process and, and, and the mechanism for it is a little bit more, I think, related. So I think they are more closely the genera that are there, but essentially they're modified leaves, Mm -hmm. um, that have, um, uh, essentially formed into a tube or a pitcher or a trumpet, depending on how you want to describe it. There's Mm -hmm. an opening at the top and that is the opening where insects or anything else. I mean, some pitchers, are large enough, <clears throat> and there's been records of them record, uh, um, capturing um, reptiles and birds and even small oh, wow. mammals um, in some areas. Um, wow. And there's all sorts of interesting relationships with pitchers, uh, pitcher plants, and other animals that have either that use the pitcher as their habitat. So there's some. Oh, yeah, insects. Jill. Jill told me I, actually an episode a while back. Jill told me about a frog that like doesn't yeah. get digested and like lives yeah. in the pitcher plant. Yeah, and they're, that's they're, super and, cool. Yeah, and there's there's some insects that as well um, they uh, use the the liquid, but the fact that there's um, a pretty steady supply of prey, and I think there's probably some ah. studies that could be done to determine the pitchers that have um, like mosquito larvae and midges and 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 some of the some of the different bacteria and protozoans in a certain concentration do they actually do better because that whole collection of of insects and animals that are there does it help them break down the prey better than if it was just them on their own with enzymes does it take longer do they actually get more nutrients when there's a um, a bigger amount of of you know fl- uh, fauna i guess that that are um located there i i didn't see anything interesting in, in my yeah. brief research but i do find that fascinating that they capture and digest some insects but yet there's other insects that use their pictures for their habitat this is where they they are purposely laid and mature and grow up um uh, there. So, so yeah, so there's this tube structure. Um, they have determined it, And again, there, there's over 500. I forget what the number is. It's, I think it's over 500 and I'll find it sometime somewhere in my data, but over 500 species of different pitcher plants. But I know that some of them 
the pitcher itself doesn't open until there's already liquid that is collected in the pitcher. So it's not just rainwater. Oh. And then there, and then some enzymes get kind of dumped in there. They're actually, I mean, there's, it's probably a good portion of it that is water, but it's water that's coming in to the plant um, being deposited in the leaf with whatever chemical composition that's come, you know, being ex- exuded from the leaves before the lid opens or before the leaf opens uh, that the trumpet mm-hmm. or the, you know, um, and then even some of them have what they call uh, it's, it's essentially a lid. It's an operculum that, covers the pitcher to keep rainwater from getting in there and diluting anything or flooding it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's supposed so, to be important. Uh, yeah. Cause you, yep. and yeah. If, some of them are super tiny. Uh, the purple pitcher plant, I think I saw was they can be up to 30 centimeters. So what is that? That's a oh. little over a foot. If, that's, you know, at, oh, that's at, bigger than I imagined. Yeah. And, and then there's some that are actually quite, quite large. Some of the tropical pitcher plants are um, uh, quite, uh, surprisingly large, um, or at least I think for um, for a pitcher. So the, the uh, yeah. purple pitcher plant does it have a lid like that, or does it have a mechanism to keep water out? Yes, there there is a bit of a um, a bit of a cover that um, uh, is formed. Again, that's it's all one structure of the leaf, um, but there's a mm-hmm. bit of the tip that comes over the top of the opening to do its best to kind of keep um, uh, you know rainwater or whatnot uh, from from entering and collecting in the plant. So. They, like I mentioned, in where I was in Minnesota, they um, are very common in bog, uh, marshy, uh, what's the, all the other terms for that, but bog, marsh, um, wetland, swamp, swamp. sort of area, yeah. swamp, exactly. Um, and those tend to be areas where, you know, despite there being like a, what look like a lot of vegetation, there's actually not a lot of nutrients that are um, that are there. And so that's that's why perhaps it, it's chicken egg, but like um, perhaps that's why they developed this ability or they had this ability, but in other areas, they were, you know, more readily outcompeted by plants that, that didn't need to do this to get the, um, the nutrients. And it, it sort of, they kind of got relegated to these areas that were low nutrients, but this is where they, they performed well. Um, and that could be said for any carnivorous plants. Most of them do occur in areas where, there's um, some deficiency in um, readily available nutrients for them. So that's, that's how they sort of reverted to, or I mean, not reverted is the right word. That's how they evolved to um, uh, this life of, 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 you know, being carnivorous or insectivorous. And it depends on, it depends on the, the species, right? Cause some of them are truly insectivorous, but some of them, you know, it's, it's sort of anything that gets in there. <laughs> yeah. Anything that gets in there. Right. So they're, yeah, they're not yeah. discriminatory. <laughs> Yeah, they don't really have control over what what gets in there, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's that's super interesting. Okay, um, let let me ask a couple other questions. Um, I think going back to my kindergarten understanding of um, carnivorous plants, we only think about the carnivorous part, but plants also have like particularly other parts, and particularly I think I'm interested in the flowers and the fruit of the pitcher plant, which it must have. I, I don't yeah. know what they look like, but but what's the deal with those? Yeah, so they actually, they, they, they do. So a couple of things, um, the plant itself, uh, purple pitcher plants, uh, as opposed to, and I, and to, to be clear, I, I can't say for certain about, um, whether there's anything that's specific to the genus that they're part of, um, which, uh, I, I know that that's kind of a, a regular thing, um, in the group is to sort of give the, um, species name. And I'm just, checking through my notes to make sure I can go to the page where I've put the, um, the better pronunciation. I want to make sure that I, I pronounce it um, uh, correctly, but it's Saracenia is the genus name and Purpurea is the species name. Um, so not being certain if others within that genus Sar- uh, Saracenia do this as well, but they have rhizomes and that's primarily how they grow and spread. Um, but they do uh-huh. produce seeds and, um, so to your point, um, they actually, I think, have quite a beautiful flower. It's very complex. To me, it's almost like an, uh, an orchid. Um, and I won't get into the details because I didn't um, make too many notes about this, but it is, a, it is, a, it is described as being a complex floral structure. Um, they are pollinated by bees. Um, there are other 
insects that also can pollinate them, but I think they're primarily pollinated by peas, bees from what I, what I read. They would probably have to be this, a smaller species because mm-hmm. the flower is, is um, it, it's, it grows in a way where the, the, the insect, the bee, has to really sort of force its way into the flower. And that's sort of uh-huh. how it's getting <laughs> the pollen. It has to do that to get to the nectar. And then they have the male and female part separated so that there isn't, uh, it limits the possibility of doing the, um, uh, the self fertilization. Um, and so the insect, when it gets to the next flower has to do the same thing and sort of force itself inside. And so I guess mm-hmm. the, the pollen for the other plant is able to then be transferred. The seeds are really quite small. And I actually read somewhere where, um, there's a wonder of how the purple pitcher plant has such a wide distribution. Essentially it is from, there's some populations that are below this and, and I think it is considered a separate subspecies, but essentially from Maryland North uh, through new England across to um, the Midwest and then completely through Canada um, is the range for it. So it has the largest range of any of the pitcher plants. And this article was, was mentioning that that, that, that it isn't clear how that may have happened because their seeds are so tiny and, and their distribution when, when the seeds uh, mature and come off the plant, essentially the seeds fall like immediately right next to the parent plant. <laughs> so it's not like this Interesting. broad just distribution. So how they got to be so widely distributed. Um, they're also the, for all the pitcher plants, they are uh, the species that grows the furthest north and into the the coldest, yeah, habitat or you know the yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, you know, my understanding of you know carnivorous plants, I always think of you know because that's where the Venus flytrap is from. But it's also mm-hmm. a lot. It's like North Carolina, South Carolina, very like hot summer swampy. Yeah. So when you said Minnesota, I was a little bit surprised. And when you said like up into Canada, I was like, I was yeah, very it's, amazed it's that that's where they wide. Grow. Yeah. Um, wow. And it, it has been introduced. Um, because pitcher plants, I guess, are like most carnivorous plants, like we just said, there's a fascination with them. They, uh, I, th- I think the f- first description of them goes back to like the 1600s, sometime in the 1600s, um, when France was colonizing North America and they'd sent over explorers. There was somebody in Canada who first um, encountered the pitcher plant, and that's that's how the name, um, how, how it got named. I, again, it's somewhere in here. Um, uh, the plant itself was named after, see if I can find it readily. Um, yeah, it's somewhere in my notes. I'll find it. It was named after somebody. And then the second part, the, the species name is because the picture itself, although I've also read where it's the flower, it could have been because of the flower is where the majority of the purple color, it's, it's almost like uh-huh. a deep burgundy purple. It's a, it's a actually a very, I think very, very beautiful plant. Uh, even with, you know, the flowers, the complex flowers aside, the, the picture itself is, is quite, uh, is quite beautiful itself. But yeah, that coloration, it's, it's sort of greener towards the base and more purple um, towards the, the top. Yeah, I, li- I like those obvious uh, Latin names where you, you yeah. so, okay, Puparea. Oh, that's the purple one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but for the audience, tell us about those notes that you have in front of you, or the, at least that notebook you show me. So when I finally realized I had a much more meaningful connection to, to be on the show to talk about the pitcher plan, I mean, I spent a whole summer being devoured by mosquitoes and horse flies. I was traipsing out into bogs. I was falling through the bogs up to my waist in water. I was attacked by leeches. Um, uh, and yet I, I'm choosing to say this was a very fond memory, but like, so when I realized the picture <laughs> plants, I, I thought if I could only go back to some of my notes and then I, I thought I recalled, cause I moved within the past year. I was like, I thought I recalled seeing some, some old paperwork, some old stuff that I had. And lo and behold, in a drawer, one of my nightstands, um, I found my notes from 1991 that was for for both my plant biology and my ecology. So all my original um, dot matrix reporting, um, the pages are all done in dot matrix. I have overheads, (laughs) like overhead sheets that were used um, 
to present like the maps and the data we were i can't remember what we were using to produce the graphs or whatever they're, they're really um I'm really being dated by the research and, and that, that, but I was so excited to find it and to use it. Like it is that notebook has not been opened in forever, but yet there are yeah. all my notes from that summer, which just brought the whole experience um, back. I found myself reflecting not only about the class, but just the summer and my professors and my classmates and Lake Itasca and how much I miss Minnesota and everything. It was a really, really nostalgic experience for me to go back through and find, um, find some of this information. Super cool. Um, I know this is a, not a visual medium; it's a podcast. But could you just like pick a random page and just show me what it looks like inside? I'm just curious. Oh. Just anything. I just just uh, just randomly. I'm curious because it's a pretty thick little notebook you got there. Well, this is just oh, there's part a cool the, um, um, the a map. Yeah, it shows like Itasca and it shows Bog D, which is where we did our location research. of Bog D. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Cool. And, and this, so cool. this hash area, this hashtag. This is the 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 boggy the sphagnum moss area that we could walk around the middle of it is the open area the open water um but that it was throughout bog d that we found um or that we um got the specimens that we were using um not that we collected Very good them, mapping we... it, that that stuff really makes you take for granted today like how easy it is to map stuff with like Google oh yeah maps and stuff. <laughs> yeah you know because that map you have i'm sure was like not hard was not easy to like produce something no no, so no. And, and that, this one, as you can tell is hand drawn this part yeah <laughs> so, yeah yeah <laughs> Super old school. The leaves of the pitcher plant grow out in all directions from the root, forming a circle about it. It is called the pitcher plant because its leaves are shaped somewhat like a pitcher. The pitcher plant is difficult to transplant. It should therefore be studied in its natural environment. Well, thank you for sharing about purple pitcher plant uh, with me. Do you mind if I share a plant with you? No, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. That was super cool. I I, I, I got to go f see some of those. Those uh, anyway. Um, so I picked a plant that is that is entirely unrelated. Uh, sometimes I try to make the plants match, but I, I couldn't mm. think of anything because I don't have a lot of experience with carnivorous plants. Really, uh, the last episode we talked about carnivorous plants, it was the Venus flytrap, and that was even more aspirational because I've never really like grown <laughs> them. I just like think they're cool and like cool. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So the plant I picked, I was kind of kind of going back, and I decided to pick a plant that has some meaning to me. That's also maybe kind of a weird plant. That's not like your average plant, which may, I don't know what is an average plant, but anyway. <laughs> um, the, the so I when I was uh, I was in middle school, I lived in Twenty Nine Palms, California. My mom was in the Navy. I've talked about this on a few episodes, and that 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 is a place where I've gone to a few times for for lots of interesting plants. Desert plants are super uh, cool and often pretty weird. Um, and this one, uh, my memory of is is uh, my there was one of this plant. I'll I'll, I'll name it in a second. There's one of this plant that was in my neighbor's yard, but this is also one of the first plants that I remember. Like I think my sister had a book about like plants around and their medicinal uses. And mm. this is the first time I remember of like of like recognizing what a plant was from a book. Like I knew where the plant was, but then I was like, oh, that's the plant. And it's it's an easy plant because it's so it's so like iconic. Or like it's so easy to identify, um, but also it was the first time, one of the first times I remember thinking about that plants have medicinal uses or can have medicinal uses because this was a book all about that kind of uses and of desert plants. And the plant I'm choosing is called um, Ocotillo. Are you familiar with Ocotillo? No. It's a super cool plant. It, it's pretty weird. It looks like just a bunch of crooked spiny poles sticking out of the ground. Um, and they're very tall. They're like, you know, you know, can be eight to 10 feet tall and they just like splay up out of the ground. And it's pretty interesting because the, the branching only happens at the base. So that's why it has a, such a strange kind of like bunch of sticks uh, sticking out of it. Yeah. Feel free to Google and you'll see what I, what I mean. I Ocotillo. believe I have seen it before, but yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty interesting. Also because um, unless it's raining or it's flowering, Mm -hmm. they kind of look like dead sticks too like it, it will be quite brown not not very green at all and it kind of just looks like a, a, a like a whole bunch of dead poles you know dead dead branches sticking straight up out of the ground like someone just like stuck them in the ground and left them there um so they're, they're pretty interesting that way um they you know they they have these spines um and they're in the desert so one might think that they're a cactus but they're actually not a cactus they are mm. they're in they're in they're not even in the same uh, order as cacti actually they're in a separate order um mm. so uh they're they're in their own family there's there's only a few of them 
and most of them were in South America. I think the Alcatillo is the only one in North America. And uh, um, cactus are actually, I just learned this, they're in the uh, order Caryophyllales, which I think many pitcher plants are in that order. Maybe Not all of them, but I think a lot are. Okay. I looked that up when you said that. But these are in order uh, Ericales, which is in the same order as tea, persimmon, and blueberry. And so they're kind of a little bit of a special desert plant because they're not in the same like realm as some of the other desert plants. So they're, yep. they're cool. No, and this is what I remember from plant biology was the, the relationships. Plants are so adaptable and so influenced by their habitat that, that similarly related species look nothing. You would yeah. never guess that they're related to something else. Like, and so you saying that's um, tea plants and um, blueberry, I never... Yeah, I never would have uh, yeah. imagined. You, you'd think they're more related to a cactus because they really do Absolutely. have the same, but like those two different uh, evolutionary tracks kind of uh, evolved the same characteristics to live in a desert, but kind of from different routes, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about some of the names. So um, uh, the scientific name is Fucaria splendens. And this is one of those examples that happens all the time. It's a desert plant native to like the deserts of North America, but it's named after a French dude named Fou- Pierre Fouquier. Because I, I, I probably Linnaeus did it. That's just a theme. He just like went down the list of every plant dude he knew and named a plant after him. <laughs> I think. <laughs> so you wanted uh, yeah, to be friends that's... with him, right? So you could be, <laughs> you could yeah. uh, have something named after you. Totally, totally. Um, and then Splendens just means. Uh, gleaming but i think in this case it means striking so they're they are very striking plants mm-hmm. um maybe there's a gleaming aspect uh which i'll talk about now um the name ocotillo is a pretty interesting one um when you first google it it says that that means a little torch but i was trying to be like well what's what's yeah. the word for torch in spanish i don't think it's it's ocot but apparently it's based on a nahuatl word for torch which there's the word now Nahu- the language nahuatl the word for torch is ocotl with a hanging L like that. And so okay. the Spanish turned it into ocotillo, and it means a little torch. It is also sometimes called candlewood. And the reason why it's called little torch mm. or candlewood is because you might see some of the pictures there. It has these bright red flowers that are just at the tip. So in the distance, it looks like a bunch of candles or torches with these bright red, beautiful, beautiful flowers. I don't think I saw those many times when I was a kid, but they're really mm-hmm. stunning, the flowers that are on the top. No, and that's the photo I have is one that's in its prime, and it looks exactly the way you're describing it. But um, I can't quite tell by the photo. But how tall do you do you remember how tall these? Oh yeah, were they they, you... they get to like ten, twelve feet tall. They can that's be very what this tall. looks like. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, 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 it looks quite large. Uh, very you know very long um, stems or branches. They're quite long, and then yeah, they're 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 really just branched at the bottom. So it'll be like you know twenty to sixty or something of these individual branches sticking up from the ground. Um, is pretty interesting um they have a really interesting um uh which i don't you know, I don't think i ever noticed this when i was a kid because i was not looking close enough but they uh most of the time they can photosynthesize from their like from the green on their on the surface of the branch like a lot of cacti can do right because mm-hmm. cacti don't really have leaves they photosynthesize from them or often those pi- pads are like modified leaves or stems and they photosynthesize from there but when it rains, apparently the Ocotillo will then just very quickly send out all these little oval leaves, like super quick. And it and it takes advantage of that when it has the rain to do it. And then the leaves will fall off pretty quickly. And I read that depending on the weather, an Ocotillo can, can cycle leaves like five times a year, depending. Because it's based yeah. on the rain, not based on the season. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and that's, um, I was going to say, the, the, the whole desert adapted species, like how responsive they are to rainfall like how yeah. quick they are because totally. like you said they, they look like they're dead until yeah. they have rain and then suddenly they're alive like overnight almost probably um, yeah yeah so i really want to see that as well i need to go back out of the desert sometime now that i've really gotten into plants and reassess because th- there are such cool plants and as far as like the places i've lived before i was into plants the plants mm-hmm. there have stood out to me just because they're all so different and they have like uh, really interesting properties and um, and and often really st- stunning things about them. Um, let's see the last little things here. Let me look through my notes. Uh, the last little things have to do with that uh, that book that I had when I was a kid, and I don't remember that. I think I found it. I'll put a link in the show notes. 
but I, I, I was just Googling in general, like, what are its uses? It has a whole bunch of touted medicinal uses, which, you know, that, that gets complicated, and I don't want to recommend any, <laughs> any uh, medicinal use that I don't know about. But, but read about it, audience, and if you're near Ocotillo and you, and you want to, like, look at some of that. But it's got a lot of um, traditional uh, indigenous uses for medicinal purposes. But also, I guess the leaves um, are edible and taste a bit like spinach. So if you happen to, like, be lucky enough to be there when it's leafing out, you could have a nice little... Uh, greens and then the flowers most commonly they're eaten fresh in salads and apparently they're quite sweet or they're dried for tea and i really want to I, I was just googling this i want to track down someone who's like selling some ocotillo flower tea so that would be kind of a fun thing to try um because i've never i've never experienced that but yeah apparently they do have a, a decent amount of uh, uses oh another few uses they have is um they're pretty popular as um being made into walking sticks because they're they're strong but they're pretty lightweight. So they have a really interesting property that way. And they're also often used for um, living fences because if you plant them on the edge of a property, if you see a bunch of those together, you can imagine how they can keep keep things out or keep things in depending um, because of their spines and things like that. Yeah, no, that's, uh, they're, they're really beautiful. I mean, when they're flowering in particular, you know, not every plant comes down to its flowers, although that's usually what a lot of them are um, recognized for. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's a very interesting plant. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting that the flowers only come out of the top. So that candle or, or torch look is pretty interesting. Um, I can't think of another plant right now that really just does that, right? The, the flower, normally you'll have flowers all up and down. And that's where the leaves come. And then I guess, I guess I, I couldn't quite wrap my head around this. The, the spines are like somehow formed from where the leaves come out as well. But I'm not quite sure that process. But I think they're they're pretty... The spines are pretty um, biologically different from the spines in cactus. So yeah, that was Acatillo. So thanks for uh, letting me share that uh, cool desert plant with you. Yeah, no, thank you. It's um, it's always good to learn about something new, especially when it's a cool plant like that. So thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the whole point of this podcast, at least for me. I'm forcing myself to learn <laughs> new things all the time. And yeah, thanks for sharing the purple uh, purple purple pitcher plant. Pitcher with plant. Me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Cool. Oh, no, again, thanks. I'm I'm glad I finally could. Uh, could get on the show here i um i really enjoyed doing the research and reminiscing and being um finally being a guest so thank you okay one quick last interesting fact about the purple pitcher plant before we go uh, i was doing some research after talking with chris and we were talking about the the enzymes that digest in, in pitcher plants and i thought that was uh, you know an interesting topic so i started reading about it and i have found something kind of surprising which actually kind of sheds a little bit of light on chris's uh, uh undergrad research project it turns out that though most pitcher plants do excrete digestive enzymes into the liquid in the base of the pitcher plant it seems that purple pitcher plants don't really do that uh there's an article i found that's called mutualism between carnivorous purple pitcher plants and its inhabitants that describes the variety of creatures that live in the liquid of the purple pitcher plant which chris alluded to so there are aquatic mites there's a variety of bacteria there's protozoa there's larvae of midges and mosquitoes and uh and the theory is that these creatures do the digesting for the pitcher plant it's kind of like a uh like a composting process, I guess, or, you know, like in water, the water, water does do a good job of breaking things down. So the animals get trapped because of the hairs. They can't get out. They eventually die. And then all the um, processes that happen with these bacteria and other living creatures in the liquid break down the insects. And then the pitcher plant absorbs that, which is really interesting. And so, yeah, there's even been some studies uh, that I've read where they tried to like look specifically for enzyme activities in the liquid of the purple pitcher plant. And they really found very, very little, if any at all. So that's a pretty interesting um, adaptation, you know? Why why make that stuff when you can have other creatures do it for you? And it's a kind of a win-win thing, because they get to also benefit from that material. So I thought that was a pretty interesting little fun fact about the purple pitcher plant. And with that, let's end our episode. My guest on this episode of Rootbound was Chris Jamison. Chris is a DC-based nature lover who served as an environmental Peace Corps volunteer and worked as a professional conservationist. He is currently developing his passion for gardening when he's not helping people navigate the real estate market. If you want to buy a house in DC, give Chris a call. 
If you like Rootbound and you want to help support the show, visit rootboundpodcast.com slash support to find all the ways you can, including supporting the show on Patreon. Rootbound is hosted by budding botanist Steve Ellington. Music by Christian Kriegeskota. Fake ads by David Lani. Rootbound is a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. But if you can go outside, you could persistently peruse the peatland, passionately pursuing the precious purple pitcher plant. Say that five times fast. Poa Pretensis, the original banjo-free bluegrass.